Welcome to our discussion of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today we have the privilege of discussing the 60th and 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah. Joining me for the discussion are three professors from the Department of Ancient Scripture. I'm Terry Ball from that department and joining me is Professor Victor Ludlow. Welcome Vic. Thank you. Good to be here. Sitting next to Vic is Professor Terry Zink. Welcome, Terry. Good to be here. Glad to have you with us. And once more joining us is Professor Ray Huntington. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Thanks Glad to have you with us, too. Chapter 60. I love this chapter. Uh, you know, as Isaiah is closing out his book, he really tries to make the point that there are a group of people called the Gentiles who are going to play a vital, vital role in the Latter-day Restoration of the covenant people and preparing the world for the coming of the millennial Messiah. He has this vision and I think he just has such a, it's so important to him that the Latter-day Gentiles, this group of people, uh, get the message. Maybe we ought to start by first talking about the term Gentiles and, and what it means because it seems to be a dynamic term, right? Uh, one that the meaning of it seems to change through time and, um, and among people. Can I use a reference here to how apparently Joseph Smith seems to have used it, at least in section 109, this great dedicatory prayer on the Kirtland Temple. Uh, in verse 60, he is speaking to the Lord here. He's saying, We have spoken before thee concerning the revelations and commandments which thou hast given unto us. Those early mm -hmm. saints there. Who are identified with the Gentiles. And then he goes on to say, well, but thou knowest that thou hast a great love for the children of Jacob and for the, those that are scattered for a long time. And we ask thee to have mercy on the children of Jacob to begin their redemption, that the yoke of bondage can be broken off from them. And the children of Judah, verse 65, and cause that the remnants of Jacob who have been cursed and smitten because of their transgressions be converted and so forth. And then verse 67, and may all the scattered remnants of Israel start to come back. So we are the ones here, Joseph and all those others, who are identified with the Gentiles. But let's get the rest of Israel coming in and gathering. So yes, Joseph and others, they weren't the kind of the normal Semitic, uh, olive complected kinds of peoples that you would think of as the house of Israel. They're identified more with other nations, particularly of Europe at this time. Uh, but we are the ones who are here now and we're called Gentiles or identified with the Gentiles. So I think it's, it's the scattered remnants of Israel among the Gentiles. So when, the, when Isaiah is talking to the Gentiles, he's, 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 it's an invitation to those who have ears to hear those who are these scattered remnants of Israel. Come on back home. Now's so the time. So Gentiles is not a necessarily a genealogical statement here, but uh, they're called Gentiles because they're scattered, um, maybe not recognized yeah. as part of the original. Yeah. And, and probably family. primarily Gentilish ancestry, but there is within them these remnants of Israel lineage and, and ancestry as well. The blood of the house of Israel, some blood some, is, yeah. is flowing in their veins uh, and their people perhaps living in a Gentile country mm -hmm. surrounded by Gentiles. Now initially yeah. a Gentile is in the earliest Old Testament times, of course Gentiles translated from, from Goyim which means Goyim. literally just the nation. nations. Initially a Gentile was anyone who was not a member of the house of Israel but in the latter days uh, there's been a paradigm shift, huh? I've always wondered if the shift didn't take place when the, lost, when the northern tribes were carried away. So you go from being Israel or Gentile to being Jew or Gentile because in the minds of the Jews, the only ones who are left who are Israelites are Jews. Part of themselves. Mm -hmm. Terry, you were going to add something. Oh, yeah, I think the, uh, one way to illustrate the change that has gone in the name is there was a, a very famous uh, uh, speaker who came here to be while he was a rabbi, and he was a pretty sharp guy, and I remember him saying, you know, quipping that the, this is the only place where I can come and be considered a Gentile. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the, 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 the modern day definition of Gentile is, is someone who has not entered into the covenant. So, so in, in Old Testament days, it's anyone who's not, who's not uh, of the house of Israel. In our day, it's, it's anyone who has not entered the covenant. So we, we're, all of us here at the table are probably Gen, you know, would be considered Gentiles from the first definition, but we're, we're all considered uh, House of Israel by the second definition. So we're both Gentiles and, 
And so maybe that's what the Book of Mormon means when it says yeah. the Gentiles are numbered among the house of Israel, meaning they've entered into the covenant. Right. Right. Now, back in chapter 56, Isaiah made it clear that Gentiles that enter to the covenant are not second-class citizens. They have access to all the blessings. Yeah. In this chapter, he seems to say that they have some responsibilities that come with those blessings as well. Uh, let's turn to the text now and, uh, and talk some about, about it. Uh, the first verse always reminds me of the Cougar Fight song, Arise and Shine, <laughs> for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon us, upon thee. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. What do you suppose he's talking about? Apostasy, yeah. ignorance. There's this period of apostasy, but the Lord has a plan, right? He arises upon thee, his glory is seen upon thee, and Gentiles shall come to thy light. Who's he talking about here? In terms of thy light. Well, and what's the light? The brightness exactly. Of brightness. Would yeah. that be the restoration? And all the, the Gentiles shall come to thy light. Who's thy here? Is this the church? We're we talking about the yeah. Joseph Smith, the, the, the covenant, the, covenant the priesthood, the, yeah. mm -hmm. to the new truth, the knowledge, Prophets. and intelligence. Yeah. And you'll, he tells them to lift up your eyes and see. They'll all gather themselves together. It reads a little bit like chapter 49, verse 18, where all these Gentiles are coming, remember, and I recognize. Bringing, bringing Israel. Yeah. Carrying them. And the, the ancient covenant people look at him and said, where did you come from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so many of them. Well, well, just a thought, a question. Uh, it's easy for me to understand, verse 3, that Gentiles, we've already, already discussed the meaning of that, shall come to the light. But what do you think he means by kings to the brightness of thy rising? Yeah. Is there a connection between entering into the covenant and laying claim to kings and to king, kingdoms and principalities and thrones? It's a provocative question, isn't it? It is. Yeah, well, it, I, it I think he's, where, where kings is, is seen in parallel with Gentiles, you know, the kings of these, I mean, if you're talking about ancient Israel, he's saying that, that Israel will be restored, that uh, these, these other nations will, will step forth and they'll help you, and, and, and he's just repeating that by saying kings, I mean, that's a parallel with Gentiles, will come to the rising, or the, uh, the brightness of thy rising, so. Yeah. Now, what's, so it could be the people, another way of looking at it, it could, it could be the people and their leaders. Their leaders, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and then they become kings by entering the covenant too. So there's several levels of interpretation mm -hmm. here too. Uh, look mm -hmm. what happens here in verse 3. He says the Gentiles are coming in verse 3. He tells them, look, lift up your eyes and look around, you people. They come, thy sons come from far. So in verse 3, they're called Gentiles. By the time you get to the end of verse 4, they're called sons. Sons and, and daughters. daughters. So sons and daughters. They may be Gentiles, but once they come to the light, yeah. they're now recognized as part of the covenant family. Like King Benjamin said, they become children of the family. I mean, they would be spiritually begotten yeah. children of Christ. You're now in the family, yeah. the I covenant like, family. I like that concept too in verse 4 that, uh, that they'll be nursed yeah. at thy sight. You know, they'll, they'll be brought into this family that you talk about, Vic, and, and who's going to nurse them? Take care of them. It's mm -hmm. going to be those that have been established, that are waiting, mm -hmm. and, and it's kind the of... The Gentiles that, are often referred to as nursing fathers yes. and nursing mothers. Yeah, absolutely. Who come. Yeah, and thou shalt see and flow together. Yep. Mm -hmm. you're, all, you're all coming together to this. And so these Gentiles seem to be really have an important role of, of entering the covenant and then gathering the scattered people so they're all brought together. Um, notice in verse 7 it says, The flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, the rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee, and they shall come up with an acceptance on mine altar. Mm -hmm. Here again we seem to see things that are being accepted as as um, they'll have access to temple blessings yeah. and ordinances mm -hmm. and so forth. Now, here's a provocative phrase. I'm interested what your take is on verse 9. He says, Surely the isles shall wait for me. When Isaiah talks about the isles, what's he talking about? Any landmass surrounded by water. Yeah. So it yeah. could Cambridge. be continents, is what we would call continents. But for the ancient Semites, it's still an island. Just a super big island, they didn't distinguish. Yeah, that's literally. Islands. What about figuratively when he says, when he calls out to the isles and the isles that are waiting for me? Well, we see in the Book of Mormon the travail of crossing the great deep. There's a, there's a barrier, there's a, a chasm between being out there and lost and coming into the promised land. And so if you're out there on the island, how are we going to get you to come back? Well, he talks about the ships here. First, to bring thy sons. In other words, we've 
to bring thy family, and then also thy gifts, thy talents, your abilities, come to the promised land to help build the kingdom. You know, it refers to Isles in chapter 49 as well. He says, listen, O Isles, unto me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You remember who he's talking to in that chapter? Because there's some verses added to that in the Book of Mormon account mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. This is First Nephi chapter 21. It's quoting Isaiah 49 verse 1. Hearken, O ye house of Israel, all ye that are broken off and are driven out because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people, yea, all ye that are broken off that are scattered abroad who are of my people, O house of Israel, listen, O isles. It seems like he's also saying that isles are also, is a phrase meaning scattered covenant yeah. people. Mm -hmm. And so in verse 9 when he says, the isles are waiting for me, who's, who's waiting for him to come and do this work? He scattered Israelites among the nations. Yeah. And then verse 10, look at this. And sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. Means? Mm -hmm. The term strangers again is referring to Gentiles. Yes, right? mm -hmm. coming into right. the church. And what do they do? <coughs> They'll build up the walls. Their kings will minister. In other words, they're going to be a blessing to, to, uh, to, to established Israel. Yeah. They're going to be doing some things. So once again, Gentiles play a really important role yeah. in this latter-day gathering and redemption establishment of the covenant people. The sons of strangers come to the light. They, uh, they nurse you. They help build your walls. Then they're recognized as part of the covenant family. And, and, they, and they, the, the work is going to be going on day and night, verse 11. I mean, when you consider where all the missionaries are around the world, I mean, literally... Yeah. All the time, there's some kind yeah, of just like people the bringing in. That the sun will never set on the uh, the English, the British Empire it never sets on missionary work either. That's right. Yeah. Well, and these people will come in and bring talents to build up the church. Uh, some will bring money and finances, and some will bring other talents. You know, literally, when you think about the Salt Lake Temple, who did the stonework on that temple? A lot of these. New, a lot of these converts coming converse. out of England and Denmark mm -hmm. and they elsewhere. They build up your walls literally. Literally, yeah, yeah Good literally. Point. And in verse 17, these <laughs> gifts and talents that they bring, I, I love this verse, uh, where the Lord says, "For brass, you know, if they bring forth something of brass, I bring, will bring gold, and for iron, I will bring silver." So we may bring an offering that, that maybe have some value, some gift or talent that we have, but. In return, I mean, gold is far more precious than brass and silver, far more valuable than, than iron. Mm -hmm. But what if you don't even have any great gifts or contributions to make? Well, continue in the verse, uh, and, and for wood, brass, and for stones, iron. I mean, wood and stones are just around. You can just find them, pick them up, and, and bring, bring it along. And, and so now you've got brass and iron, and then you develop your gifts and talents, kind of like the parable mm -hmm. of the talents. You multiply them, and then you raise it up to another level. But to me, the main message here, uh, whatever we bring to the Lord, and it's, whether it's something simple, just a natural sort of thing, or something a little more refined and valuable, what he gives us back is always far more than we can ever bring and give to it him. takes what we offer and makes it better. He magnifies mm -hmm. it, yeah, yeah. yeah, very much so, like the widow's so mind. the strangers come in, they use their talents, God magnifies them and he accomplishes this yeah. great work. Right. The work ultimately leads to verses 18 through 22, which we, right. yeah. we understand as millennial. I, I, love the, I love the language here. Yeah. Go ahead and read verse um, 18 and 19 for us, for example, Terry, would you sure. do that? Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. This makes you ache for a millennial day. Yeah. Yeah. He's you know, going to talk about that a lot more before he finishes his writings. That, that becomes his favorite motif yeah. here before very long. The, the Lord is the source of light and there's an end of violence. And, and this whole yeah. millennial reign. Yeah. You know. It's interesting that the, the walls and the gates which were used to protect them are no longer needed. It's, it's salvation and praise that now protects them. It's great stuff. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, a very wonderful promise about Gentiles coming to the light and playing such a vital role then in gathering and leading up to this millennial reign. I, I have written at the top of this, I have written the phototropic Gentiles. <laughs> Phototropism <laughs> is a bot botanical term that when, you know, if you put a, if you have a plant in the window, all the leaves point to the window to the light. If you turn it, then the leaves all turn. And 
I've always thought, I want to be a phototropic Gentile. <laughs> I want to be drawn to the light, and when I get there, make sure I'm productive. Now, let's move on to chapter 61 with the time we have. Um, the first couple of verses of chapter 51 are very well known to us um, because the Savior cited them in, the, in, in his own ministry. Would one of you like to kind of review that for us? Okay, let's see. It's the first verse and a half. It was in Nazareth after he had been in the wilderness. He'd been baptized of John. So this is really, I guess you could say, the, the official beginning of his public ministry. And uh, it almost ended day one as he quoted this verse and a half because after he quoted this material and said, In me is this fulfilled, they were ready to take him and throw him off the cliff there. Uh, let, me, let me read. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day... Well, no, he stops there. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where he stops. And to me, this sounds like, well, I wish people would do this. Preach good tidings, uh, help uh, those that are captives, and, uh, and proclaim the, the year of the Lord. What's wrong with that? But obviously what they recognized, the, the, the second phrase there, because the Lord hath anointed me. They knew what this lad that they'd seen grown up in Nazareth was proclaiming. I am the anointed one. And they just weren't ready to accept that. The word anointed is? Messiah. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And of course, if you claim to be the Messiah, then that's blasphemy, right? Unless well, you are. <laughs> but not necessarily Messiah. For some, the Messiah was not, was blasphemy. There's a subtle distinction there. Messiah, for many of them, was a political figure. He wasn't necessarily the Son of God. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the problem that Christ had is he not only claimed to be the Messiah, but also claimed to be the Son of God, which was there's, which is even a greater claim. So, mm -hmm. very good, very good. Um, as he talks about what the the Messiah will do, preaching good tidings and binding up broken heart and giving liberty to captives and opening the prison, beautiful imagery, isn't it? I like verse three as well. He will give them beauty for ashes. Makes me think a little bit back, Vic, to what you were saying about verse 17 in the previous chapter. We have one thing and he can turn it into another. Mm -hmm. We have brass, he can give it, turn it to gold. But this may be more profound, isn't it? Oh, yeah, to, to, to take something that is basically worthless, uh, you know, ashes to beauty and, and, and oil of joy for mourning and, 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 and these other contrasts, that's, we just can't begin to comprehend how from something that appears to be worthless, something so valuable can be brought forth. I suppose we all know individuals who've maybe made mistakes and think their life is ashes. And yet, if we turn to the Lord, He can turn it into something beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. Verse 3 to me is a summation of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> when you think about His life, uh, water to wine, leprosy to purity. Yeah. Death, Death to life. life. Everything that he did in his mortal ministry was to take something and change it and make it better. Corruption mm -hmm. and incorruption. Yeah, absolutely. Using Paul's language. Yep. Before we leave these verses, it's, it's interesting that he didn't quote the last half of verse 2, at least in that setting there in Nazareth. A day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Apparently, those terms seem to allude more to his second coming. To when millennial he will, When he will be justified and to comfort all that mourn when everybody will, will understand he is the Lord of this earth. If everybody understood the plan of salvation and mm -hmm. understood the role of suffering and disease then, then, and, and death, then, then we wouldn't have so much need to mourn and feel lost. Uh, there's also another interesting aspect here. And, and we see this a few other times in these next chapters. If you read year and day in the same verse, it's a year of the Lord and a, 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 a day of a, acceptable, day of something positive, and a day of vengeance. And there are some other passages where it's a similar sort of a promise. Uh, in, in 61 verse 2 and 63 verse 4 and, and others where... Uh, 
the year is a positive blessing, whereas the day is a negative, judgmental, punishing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that ratio. <laughs> I mean, there are times when he has to come forth with vengeance, and he will bring vengeance and judgment and punishment and destruction. But compared to a day of this negative, he will also bring forth a year of blessing and reward and comfort and peace. Uh, it's a wonderful imagery that yeah. Isaiah uses here. Now, the first part of chapter 60, he talks about Gentiles and their role and then how that leads up to the millennial reign at the end of chapter 60. Chapter 61, this kind of ends up in millennial reign as well, where he comes and gives beauty and so forth. And then what is he doing in verse 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9? He's turning back to talking about the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So you've got Gentiles to start this section, and Gentiles to end this section. And what do you have in the middle? This whole... The millennium. Well, yeah, yeah. The Christ and his role. I, w I've, I read this and I wonder if it's intentional. Be you know, often in kind of a chiastic fashion when you have repeating themes, the thing you want to stress the most is right in the middle. Yeah. And, and, and it's not just his millennial reign, it's just his coming and his being yeah, here on yeah, earth, true. period. Very, very First true. and second coming. So we have the Gentiles, though, that seem again to be playing a very important role in bringing all this about and in God's plan to redeem his people. And he uses some imagery similar to chapter 60 uh, in verse 10. Remember in chapter 60 he said, The sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. Mm -hmm. So obviously they're masons. But what are they in <laughs> verse 5 as well in chapter 61? Well, shepherds, shepherds, uh, shepherds and plowmen. Uh -huh. Farmers. Yeah. Uh, he often uses this imagery of, um, of likening the covenant people to, uh, to a vineyard or to a sheep mm -hmm. and they're not productive or, or being obedient. And what do the strangers do? read Gentiles in this case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They seem to come in and make you productive again. Again, these Gentiles are going to play such a vital role in uh, redeeming and restoring these, these people. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons of an alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Ye shall be named the priests of the Lord when men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. Obviously, what the Gentiles bring and have to offer is going to really nourish them. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 7 could be confusing. Let me read this, and maybe you could comment on what we ought to make of this. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. How do you make sense of this verse? It seems he's talking to Israel, so the second person would maybe be your shame uh, double because of your wicked. You were a covenant people. I mean, you should have known better. So you uh, received a double, a double portion of mm -hmm. scattering, yeah. punishment. So the you and whatever. yours is ancient Israel. What mm -hmm. else? Uh, but in confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Maybe the, the Gentiles, maybe the, it might be the ones he's talking about here as the third person, they, they will have their blessings, their opportunities. In their land, they shall possess the double. They're going to be receiving blessings. Now, he doesn't, you know, where do these blessings come unto them, this everlasting joy? Somehow or another, maybe even though you're being scattered among the Gentiles as a punishment to you, you and your gospel, your scriptures, and these other things, particularly of the restoration, are going to bring blessings unto them. Now, that's, that's just the way I would read it. No, I think I, that, that's no, kind I think. of the feeling I get too. We know that the covenants first went to the Israel, ancient mm -hmm. Israel, mm -hmm. and were scattered. In the latter days, according to the Book of Mormon, who does the gospel come to first? It goes to the Gentiles, Gentiles. and through them to the Jews later on. Yeah. I, I wonder if the same paradigm is being taught here. Mm -hmm. Because, you, you know, you're not living up to those covenants now. For your shame, you're going to be punished. They're going to receive an inheritance or a portion now. And then what do they do with it? Well, they become the strangers who feed your flock. flock. Yeah. You know, it is interesting that uh, throughout the Old Testament, Israel is referred to as God's firstborn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the firstborn always received a double inheritance, mm -hmm. a double portion. In this case, Israel is going to receive a double portion of judgment. And in verse 7, it also indicates that these Gentiles that are coming into the church are also going to receive a double portion. Look at the blessing. Verse 8, read it for us. Yeah. 
For I, the Lord, love judgment, and I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And they will, in a, in a sense, they're going to be uh, receiving a, a double portion as if they were the firstborn as well. Mm -hmm. Part of the everlasting covenant. Part of, part of the covenant that and the then Gentiles look at verse are nine. going to receive. Their seed shall be known among the Gentiles. <clears throat> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And their offspring among the people. They're recognized as part of the covenant. covenant family. Yeah. They are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. End of verse 9. Yeah. And then in verse 10 and 11, he talks about it's, it's like preparing for the coming of the bridegroom. You're putting on your clothes as this happens. The question always comes as you read these things then, are who are these Latter-day Gentiles who the gospel is going to be among, starting as early as chapter 11, we see that, the enzyme set up mm -hmm. amongst the Gentiles, who then have the responsibility to gather scattered Israel, and as that happens, they become recognized as part of the covenant family. Who are they? And I, th I think as Latter-day Saints, we would say, it's us. It's the church. It's yeah, the absolutely. Church. Yeah. What a privilege and awesome, awesome responsibility to fulfill the mandate here. Well, bringing this to a conclusion then today, the major themes, would someone like to summarize the major themes of chapter 60 and uh, 61 for us? Oh, 60, 61 beautiful chapters on uh, really things that are happening now, the gathering of Israel and bringing in the Gentiles, those that have been scattered and lost, and now the light of the gospel is, uh, is coming to them. But I think more importantly, the, the, the thing that I get out of these chapters is the, the blessings that these Gentiles will bring as they come into the church. And they come in with full blessings and full inheritance and a full portion uh, of God's blessings for the, for the covenant that they'll receive. And, uh, so uh, exciting times and more to come. Much, much more to come. Well said. Thank you, brethren. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.